Happy to uh, welcome back to the uh, program MBTA Chief Operating Officer Ryan Koholan to give us a little recap of uh, this uh, past uh, major red line shutdown that uh, just took place. Mr. Koholan, great to see you again, first of all. Joe, thanks so much. Great to see you again. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, it's our pleasure. This is uh, really, as we spoke before, uh, kind of a historic, uh, unprecedented project that uh, that just completed along the red line. Uh, three weeks, right? 24-day complete shutdown from Braintree to JFK, 18 miles of track. Did it work? I think uh, I think we're calling this a success, Joe. I think that, uh, you know, Monday I went out uh, on, on some of the earlier service trains and Saw an amazing sight. I saw people as we were pulling into stations, people thumbs upping, and the buzz out there was was real, and it was beyond the buzz that that I typically bring. But passengers were were really excited to get back on, and then once they got on and realized that you know what the MBTA achieved what we set out to do, and even more, uh, you know that speaks volumes to where we're at as an agency. Not going to dispute there is more work to do across the entire system. But, but we're on it and we can deliver and, and we have delivered to the red line. Yeah, I know the overall goal of this particular project was to eliminate what, what turned out to be over 30 speed restrictions, right? I think the final number was 37. We had planned on 36. Okay. Were you able to do that? We, yeah, absolutely. We were. We were. Um, and we actually, uh, one of those 37 was one that was remaining on the Ashmont branch from the previous diversion there. But we had the equipment, we had the material, we had the personnel, and it made sense to get that done. Sure. So I know this was, I mean, you know, you brought in, what, over 600 workers, 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week. Um, did it, did you accomplish everything that you hoped to do, and were there any problems along the way? Yeah, I mean, I think there's always, uh, you know, just like if you're working on, on a house and you're putting maybe a new roof on, there's always the potential for hidden damage. And we're not exempt from that. You know, we found some areas that needed some additional work. But while we were there, and again, we talked a lot, Joe, the last time we talked about the planning that goes into something like this. And, you know, you typically always plan beyond the actual number, right? You allow a percentage uh, for when you do have, again, the people and the machinery and the equipment and the skill set to tackle a problem now versus coming back six months later. It just makes sense. Um, so I think, you know, originally we had set out to do uh, 17,000 cross ties, wood, uh, wood ties. And we actually uh, came away doing a little over 18,000 ties. Because, uh, again, it made sense. Uh, this is where the work had to get done. And we want to make sure that <clears throat> recognizing the disruption that this was, and, and we definitely, you know, we, we concur and, you know, there's no way to hide behind it. It was an impactful three weeks. Um However, we wanted to make sure that we could get the work done so that we don't come back, um, you know, two weeks, three weeks, six months later. Um, so we, we took full advantage of it and got the work done. Some uh, surprises that folks have relayed to me about the project were the improvements to uh, some of the stations, uh, notably uh, North Quincy and, and JFK. Yeah, I mean, when we have, you know, that uninhibited access, don't have to worry about trains going by. Um, you know, we can get a lot of work done in a relatively short period of time, as opposed to every night for two or three hours. Um, you know, just like the the track, it's it's challenging to maintain it with that uh, that amount of time. Uh, same thing with the stations. You know, so when we can get out and change lighting and uh, paint and upgrade and update, modernize, um, you know, that's where the experience begins. It's not just about tracks and trains. You know, really, when you step into the system, that's where it begins. Yeah. So what is the travel time now on the Braintree branch, uh, Mr. Koholan? Sure. So, uh, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and even today, the headways that we're seeing are really an indicator of direction that we're going to go. Um, prior to this diversion, a typical trip between Braintree and JFK uh, could have taken up to 40 minutes, um, you know, and, and Anyone that rides rides the red line in that area, you know, and it's tough as cars on the expressway are zipping past you and you go, here I am. After this work, that same trick, uh, trip from Braintree uh, to JFK, um, I think our best time was 18 minutes and we averaged just about 19 to 20. Okay. Uh, you you know, cut it in half. Incredible. Incredible. Yeah. 
Um, on the southbound side, JFK back out. <clears throat> um, you know, we end up with just about uh, just about 20 minutes uh, average. So you can make a round trip between, and uh, this is what I did on Monday. I get out at South Station, went down to Braintree and came back in under an hour. Wow. Right. And it's been years since that was possible. So we, we really couldn't be happier. So, and I know part of the goal too was to um, increase the the headways between trains, right? So you have more frequent uh, service. Is, is that part of the goal too? Correct. So right now, uh, following the diversion, uh, typical headways, you know, barring any other issue further up the line, you know, we're we're holding to that that roughly ten minute headway, uh, which is you know far cry from the sixteen to eighteen to in some cases twenty minutes plus previously. Uh, but we're able to deliver that consistently. Uh, as I've looked at all of the actual train clear times as the week's going on, uh, you know, we're consistently delivering that, <clears throat> and it plays a big role. You know, if you're not just riding, say, from Braintree up to JFK or South Station, but how those improvements tie into the whole system, the whole red line all the way to Alewife, you have that consistent throughput where now this week we've seen regular five-minute headways within the core of the red line between Alewife and JFK and regular 10-minute headways between JFK, Braintree, and JFK to Ashmont. And now with the whole system beating to the same cadence, um, you know, now it's on us to further improve that because we are not done, Joe. Okay. Well, that, that's my next question. Then what's next? <laughs> no. So uh, in in the next, uh, in, in the, the coming weeks, um, you know, when I say the next uh, three to seven weeks, uh, we're going to start to increase uh, operating speeds. Uh, we have some more, uh, you know, uh, testing to do, verification to do, and some training to do. Uh, for our operators and our track crews. Uh, however, uh, we expect to increase speeds in, uh, in a lot of locations between JFK and Braintree up to 50 miles an hour, hmm. which a 10 mile an hour speed increase seems relatively insignificant. Now we've taken the big bite, right? We've taken the big 10 minute chunks of time. We've returned that time back to the passenger. But now is when every second really starts to count. You know, station dwell time. We talk about stations with, you know, the doors open, people get on, the doors close. Now we start to look for ways to decrease those dwell times. Because if I can shave, you know, five seconds off of every station stop, you know, along the along the whole red line corridor, you know, that's that adds up to, you know, a little under a minute hmm. um, by the time I've gone end to end. Those minutes count. That 10 mile an hour speed increase is is a step in, the, in that direction. Again, we're not talking, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minute blocks, but if I can add, you know, or, or actually subtract 45 seconds, 50 seconds, one minute, a minute and a half from everyone's trip, that's the direction we need to go. Yeah, it's well, and then it's a cumulative effect right over the course of a week. I mean, that ad adds up to real time. Right. And that real time, I mean, we're so, it's it's, it's so exciting and I think rewarding in public service to give back that amount of time to really to everyone, right? Our passengers, but our employees, right? Our employees are on the trains every day as well, you know, so as we can make sure that we're not just, uh, you know, sit, sitting there going 10 miles an hour, it's a better experience for everybody. Um, and I think that's what drives them off a lot uh, of, of public service. It's, you know, what's the benefit to the public, but this week we, we're seeing it. Yeah, I mean, I know it's 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 you know it's only been less than a week, but have you seen uh, changes in ridership after this project? Yeah. So during the diversion, we saw a lot of people divert to our ferry service. Yes. Um, you know, for the obvious reasons, it's a, it's a it's a quick trip. It's a it's a pleasant trip when the weather's good, and uh, you know, right now this time of year, beautiful to be out on the water going through Boston Harbor. Um, we saw ridership increase. And following Monday and then at the Tuesday, ridership started to trickle off and ridership returned back to normal, I would say, on the on the ferry. And, and, and now I'd say that those folks that diverted to the ferry service, they've come back to the red line. Mm -hmm. I truly believe that as people continue to recognize the improvements um, and I can speak from my experience sitting in traffic, um, you know, it's amazing now to watch a red line train uh, pass pass you in traffic at, at 40 miles an hour. And yeah. if you're in the, right, in, the, in, the, in the right spot along 93, um, you know, in the Savin Hill area, you can time it right and see a train, uh, an Ashbond train at 40, a Braintree train at 40, and a commuter rail train at 50. 
<laughs> um, so, you know, that's when you really have to stop and go, what seat should I be in? Should I be in the seat on the uh, MBTA or should I be in my car? Speaking of, I've heard a lot of uh, folks, you know, the dude have to drive. Uh, thankful that there's no more of the big Yankee yellow buses up and down Hancock Street anymore. <laughs> I know. And, you know, I, I'm glad you brought that up, Joe, because I, I recognize that this bus diversion looked uh, looked different compared to a lot of the bus diversions we've done historically. You know, typically service always went to JFK. And I know this time around, a lot of service went to Ashmont. And it being such a long-term diversion, we had the chance to adjust some patterns and try some different things. Um, you know, obviously, uh, when I put a shuttle bus on uh, on 93, particularly during those peak hours, um, I want to take advantage of the HOV lane. That's what it's there for. It makes sense. But when I can't get out of the HOV lane uh, and get crossed over in time to actually see that benefit, you know, it, it, it creates more of a burden. Some of the travel times that we saw uh, to Ashmont for service inbound to Boston were far better than what we could do on 93. We sent people out just to run comparisons to make sure we weren't crazy. Um, and, you know, sure enough, the Ashmont route proved uh, that, you know, I'm going to say 90% of the time it was faster. Um, you know, a lot of it too, at JFK, you get off of the bus it's you know, we we timed it. It's about a uh, about an eight minute eight minute walk between the bus, uh, the up and overs at JFK to get down to the platform to get the train. At Ashmont, you step off the bus. Thirty seconds later, you're on the platform. Uh, you know, so I think the the results are you know the feedback is mixed depending on what you're comfortable with. But uh, I think the folks that did uh, enjoy that that easier uh, commute. Uh, on the on the diversion service, you know, I think some, some appreciated Ashmont, some did not. Uh, but we heard you during the diversion and we we tried some different things. We tried some service, uh, you know, from Quincy directly into JFK. Um, and of course, the commuter rail proved to be uh, super important to a diversion like this. Ridership on commuter rail between Braintree and Boston uh, it exploded as anticipated. Uh, we had some trains running on the uh, on the old colony lines, Middleborough, Kingston, and Greenbush, uh, you know, at the highest capacity that they've ever seen. We added coaches. It's a balance between track space available and South Station. Mm -hmm. But uh, some of those trains, quite frankly, I think that, uh, you know, those co those coaches may remain on some of them. Because, again, people, uh, you know, people don't want to be in traffic. Yeah. So all about options. Yeah, and those... I think now that the work's done, Joe, yeah. we have options on commuter rail. Rapid transit, people learned about the ferry. You know, it, it was a good chance to to sample what works best for you. Yeah. So, um, you know, now that it's you know fixed, uh, how will you make sure that it doesn't break again? Well, we've we've done a lot of work on, on the culture of what is the MBTA and breaking away from the run to fail model. Uh, a run to fail model applies to track signals, mechanical systems. Um, you know, run it until you can't run it anymore, and uh, while, you know, there are some industries, uh, maybe that works. I can tell you that this is not one of them. So we've done a lot of work to uh, address how we maintain on that day-to-day -day basis to avoid ever having to do this again. You know, it's a great accomplishment, and I can't thank the workforce enough, um, and not just the folks that were running the shovels and, and doing the, the work during the diversion, but all the folks that planned it out. It was a success, but I don't want to do it again, you know, and we're we're going to make sure uh, as a team from the leadership right down that how we conduct ourselves and what we do moving forward, we don't replicate, right? We've proved it doesn't work and eventually you run it to failure and we're not going to do that again, Joe. Yeah. Were you able to add any new uh, red line uh, cars to the, uh, to the fleet during the shutdown? So today there's three consists out there. Uh, we expect to add a fourth consist. I want to say in the next uh, in the next ten days or so. Um, you know, there's a lot of testing that still has to occur when those cars do arrive in Boston. Uh, but you know, we're working closely with the manufacturer. They have folks on site here as well uh, for that for that commissioning process and that inspection process. Uh, you know, it's one thing to get it and put it right into service. I want to make sure it doesn't fail in service. I want to make sure that the systems that and remember these are brand new. So I want to make sure the systems that are there are functioning. We've verified, particularly the safety appliances, right down to the uh, the announcements. Mm. All that of that has to work perfectly. 
So all that happens and then we put it in service. Okay. So I know also you're looking at uh, ways to improve, as you mentioned, uh, getting service uh, vehicles onto the tracks, right, uh, to maintain this this equipment. Let's talk a little bit about that, if you could. Sure. I mean, in, so this diversion that just completed, you know, we were lucky to have a lot of options for on-track access. Some locations we we installed specifically for this diversion so that we can break the line up into different work segments, different work sections. Um, you know, and keep those workers focused on their section, so on and so forth, and also to make sure that folks stay in their area, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I think that what was envisioned is maybe some temporary access points. Uh, you know, we, we want to keep them as permanent. The uh, and Not so much uh, on the Braintree branch, but uh, I believe it's out, it, the, uh, the information was out last week or the week before, maybe. Um, the northern portion of the red line up at Alewife, yeah, you know, there's only one location between uh, the Charles River and the end of the line in Alewife to put maintenance equipment on the tracks, uh, and that makes it really difficult to maintain, uh, change materials, change ties, rail, all the things that that we expect to do. So we are uh, we are designing out a access point at Alewife which is a challenge all to its own, given the fact that Alewife Station sits up here and the tracks sit, that, sit down here. Mm. How, do you, how do you cover that grade separation? But, uh, but we're well on our way to, to doing that. And I think system-wide, when you have a legacy system like the MBTA, uh, and I think we, we hit on this, I think, Joe, when we talked last, mm -hmm. so much of the, the actual rail bed, the rail lines, they popped up. And then over the course of decades and even centuries at this point, buildings popped up, cities popped up, neighborhoods popped up, and any chance to add access, those chances were gone. So uh, we do need to be strategic about what our next steps are and how we plan, not just to run service, but plan to maintain. And if we have to, you know, uh, uh, purchase property, um, you know, adjust facilities, uh, or update facilities to afford that access, there is nothing more important than maintaining the asset. I know that uh, I've, since we last talked, I learned that you yourself, uh, Mr. Koholan, are have a locomotive engineer's license and, and maintain that. So you're really coming at this from that perspective. Definitely, definitely. I mean, I, I, I maintain my license because the point of view I get from the, the head end of a train you know, I'm I'm looking for things same as any locomotive engineer would be or motor person would be. And, you know, you can see when maybe some uh, vegetation has to be addressed. Uh, maybe there's a, a new, you know, new construction adjacent to the track is ab actually obscuring a view further down, maybe around a curb. And th that's things that I think with my experience in, in sort of my approach and the fact that, uh, you know, I'm talking to you from my office, Joe, but between you, me and everyone listening... Uh, the office is my least favorite place to be. I like to be out on the system. Um, you know, just this morning I was out uh, on the red line, on the green line. Um, you know, that's where I'm most comfortable. I like to see the passengers. I like to talk to people. I like to talk to our frontline employees. That gives me what I need to figure out now what's the next mission? What are we going to do next? And that's the beauty of, you know, particularly what I do, Joe, but I think the beauty of public service and public transportation, our jobs are never done. There's never a point where we will ever say, that's good enough, right? So, and if I'm saying it's good enough, it's probably time for me to retire. <laughs> uh, for folks uh, who want to uh, stay in touch with the T, uh, good ways to do that. Yeah, obviously the MBT's website is your is your best place to find the absolute latest and greatest with all things MBTA, whether there's uh, service changes, diversions, or delays, mbta.com uh, is, is your number one source. Obviously, the social medias, Twitter, or I think they call it X now. I'd be lying if I told you that I, I have Twitter. I don't. Um, but uh, yeah, social media, we have a team that uh, that's their job to interface on social media. Uh, full circle uh, interface too. You know, if you if you see something and you raise it up via social media, you know we we will respond. Um, so uh, that's a great tool as well. Um, you know, and uh, you know for those that still use a phone, six one seven two 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 thirty two hundred. 
can always call in and get the latest information. Great. Uh, anything else you'd like to add right now? Uh, I just, again, I really want to thank the folks, particularly along the Braintree branch. We know that it was a tough three weeks, not just for alternative service, but the impact that we had with, you know, all those diversion buses running, running on streets and taking up space. And it's a lot, but, you know, the MBTA recognizes that we are all part of a bigger community. And uh, I think it goes back to the point I made earlier. We're changing ourselves so that we do not do this again. And, uh, you know, that's my commitment, certainly to uh, anyone listening, anyone watching, and, uh, and to you, Joe, and I think to the whole Commonwealth. We will not repeat this. Every day you either win or you learn. I think this was a learning experience for a lot of people over the course of a lot of years, and it's unfortunate that uh, it had to happen, but it had to happen. So uh, I would just ask that folks uh, folks continue to support the MBTA and everything that we're doing. It's a big ship, uh, but we're heading the right direction. We're going to continue to make improvements. And like I said, you know, there's never a day where we're going to say it's good enough. We're done. I uh, appreciate your time. And uh, I know you're itching to get back outside, so I'll let you go. But uh, thank you so much for the update. Great to talk to you. Joe, thank you so much. Pleasure as always. Thank you.